So thank you very much for inviting me to speak to your Euro-Ataxia um, conference today. Julie Greenfield from Ataxia UK has asked me to give uh, quite a general overview on the current research uh, into drug treatments for Friedreich Ataxia. So I will not be showing you pictures of my mice or concentrating on my own particular drug uh, studies with the mice. Uh, it will be a, a general overview. And uh, I hope that you can hear me okay. Those of you who were up till midnight last night singing and dancing, I was one of the ones singing quite loudly, so... And dancing. <laughs> yes, yes, but, but uh, you know, that's hopefully not going to affect my performance, whereas my voice may need a bit of water every now and then. So we had a great time last night, if you didn't join us. Um, so I'm actually based in Brunel University, London, which is very close to here, maybe only 20 minutes by car, um, quite cl close to Heathrow. So uh, I don't have far to go home tonight. Okay, so just a, a couple of slides to uh, remind you um, about the molecular disease mechanism behind Friedreich ataxia. So I've been working on this disease myself since 1993 when I joined the group of Susan Chamberlain at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington uh, before the actual Friedreich ataxia gene was identified in 1996. What we have subsequently learned since uh, identifying the gene in 1996 is the fact that this disease appears to be caused in about 96% of individuals who are living with Friedreich ataxia by this unusual GAA um, mutation in the DNA of a gene called the Frataxin gene, or FXN gene for short. So in uh, unaffected individuals, we all have GAAs in this particular part of the gene, which is just called intron one you don't, that's not too relevant at the moment, um, between these other bits called exons one and two. Uh, the, we all have this to a certain extent, and it causes no problems, but with individuals living with Friedreich ataxia, the expansion occurs, so you get very large numbers of these GAA, GAA, GAA repeats. What that does, it reduces the amount of a particular protein called frataxin, and this protein is essential for life. Cells don't survive without any frataxin. We know that from initial mouse model studies, where the, so the mice also have the same gene called a frataxin gene, very similar, same function. And uh, uh, Helene Puccio, Michel Koenig's group in France, managed to delete this gene in mice and the mice do not get born if they do not have this protein. So that, we know it's essential for life. Friedreich ataxia individuals, right, um, are able to survive because they do have frataxin, but it's at just lower levels, so there's reduced amount. And in most cases, like I said, 96% of cases, it's actually normal structural frataxin. Right? The problem is just not having enough of it. In the other 4% of individuals, there is thought to be um, classical point mutations within the protein coding bits of the gene, these things called exons, which does alter the structure of the protein and therefore the function. So it's a slightly different situation. What does this um, GA repeat do? So a lot of work has tried to work out how does having this cause reduced amounts of protein. And this protein is an essential protein in a part of the cell called the mitochondria, which are responsible for producing the energy within the cell, right? Which is why um, the disease effects from this disease are primarily in cells that need a lot of energy. So the nerve cells, the heart cells, cells in the pancreas which are constantly producing insulin after you've had your, your lunch or whatever to, to deal with the glucose. So, 
a lot of research is going on trying to understand why this, how this mutation results in decreased expression of the protein, which is what this scheme down here indicates. Some of the work has shown that this um, DAA re G DNA repeat forms perhaps unusual structures, which may cause a sort of clumping up of the DNA. Right? For the DNA to be made into a protein, you need to have it in an open form. And when it's all shut down like this, this is what we in the research field currently think is the main reason why you don't get enough rituxin, right? So this is going to be relevant when I come to talk about some of the current therapeutic approaches that are being taken. So that was the background um, when the gene was first identified to code for a taxin protein in the mitochondria. And the main defect is this, just not enough for a taxin protein. The immediate research showed that this had the effect of increasing the iron in this part of the cell called the mitochondria, which has damaging effects itself. We all, we, cells need iron to survive, but if you've got too much of it, it can be damaging. That can also induce an addition, additionally also having low frataxin means you get increased free radicals or reactive oxygen species as they're also called. And these are very damaging to cells. Again, it's kind of like we, we do need free radicals um, to a certain extent for the cell to survive, but if you have too many of them, Right? The mitochondria, which producing the energy, also produce too many free radicals if you have low levels of frataxin. And these are damaging to DNA, to proteins, and to lipid. And all cells are made of lipid as well as protein uh, and other chemicals. You know, this, the membranes of cells are primarily lipid-based. The mitochondria are primarily lipid-based. So this is also part of the process which leads to um, damage from oxidative stress, as it's called, and ultimately cell death. Another thing that frataxin uh, research has shown is that what does it do normally in cells? Why, why do you need it to survive? Right? And its main function appears to be to be producing, um, to be helping to put iron, Fe, and S, sulfur, Right? as cofactors into other proteins, other enzymes that are needed uh, for basic cellular functions, primarily producing the energy as well. There are many different proteins which need FES to perform their normal functions. So having low levels of frataxin means you can have lots of different disturbances in mitochondrial function, and as we're now discovering, even in things like um, DNA um, duplication and DNA damage, the, there are effects like that. So it is actually, um, these were the initial three sort of main findings which then allowed people to immediately think of potential therapies. Kind of like the gene was found in 1996, so almost straight away 1997 people were thinking, okay, if, the, if there's free radicals, reactive oxygen species, Antioxidant drugs are available. People take them uh, quite often as uh, you know, supplements. You can buy them, certain types of antioxidants. Another thing was, well, if there's too much iron in mitochondria, drugs are also available, which have been, are being used for other disorders where there's too much iron, such as hemochromatosis disorders, thalassemias. So you can consider using iron chelators. So these were the first two immediate approaches that were considered. And then more subsequent to that was, okay, maybe we can find some ways of protecting these uh, essential proteins. And more recently, well, if the problem is not having enough frataxin, why don't we just replace the frataxin, right? Maybe that's what everyone's thinking. Straightforward, problem solved. Obviously, it's not quite that easy. Um, because you have to get this, proteins are big molecules, you have to somehow get that into the body, ideally into every single cell in the body, and then into these little bits of the cells called mitochondria. 
So it's a very technically difficult thing to do. Uh, but, as you'll see, I will talk about this in a minute, people are thinking of ways to increase for tax in using drugs. All right, I'll go through them in a minute. And also just replacing for tax in the protein itself. And then later on, after my talk, Dr. Ga Evans Galea is going to talk about the even more recent gene and cell therapy-based approaches. So I'm going to concentrate um, primarily on this right-hand side, but just to historically put things into perspective, the best way, I think, to uh, give an overview of the cur current research into the drug treatments for Friedreich ataxia is the Friedreich ataxia Research Alliance pipeline, the FARA pipeline, which I'm sure all of you are, 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 are familiar with. It's updated regularly on their website, and it's a great thing to follow. I hope you can see some of the small writing. It's a bit small, but I'll read it when I go through the different groups. This is what the pipeline was like ten, uh, five years ago, in 2010. And as you can see, the Farah pipeline on the left has divided the different stages of the progression of the research. At the bottom is the initial intellectual thought, you know, like antioxidants could be used as a therapy, right, to treat the, the free radicals that are excessive. Or iron chelators could be used because there's too much iron. Or maybe we can find some drugs to increase for taxin levels. The next level is then after that sort of intellectual thought is, okay, let's do some initial studies that are, are not so cost effective in labs using perhaps cell culture based systems or in my case using mice, mouse models and people use other animal models as well from worms through to flies all the way up to even bigger animals like rats. So that's how you can then progress to the next level of potential treatment. And then, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you then have to go through the much more expensive, time-consuming um, processes of doing clinical trials. So the phase one is the first thing you have to do. So if you've got your favorite compound, you need to see that it's safe. right? So we're not talking about even thinking about a, a therapeutic index. We're just saying, can it be given safely to humans? So that's what the small phase one trials do. If that's OK, you can then proceed to then testing efficacy um, by recruiting patients, um, patients who can come and give their time and efforts up to testing uh, in small numbers normally, perhaps just in single hospitals, single groups, whether it should then progress further um, if some efficacy is shown into the definitive stage, which is doing large studies, you need large numbers of patients to determine the statistical significant differences, right? You need to formally prove that this drug is really doing something, not that you're just observing it by chance. So that's what the phase three studies are, and they can be conducted and normally have to be, obviously with a rare disease, you would have to conduct them in many different centers which is the kind of thing that our EFACTS uh, project, the, the European funded project, was, was uh, designed for to collect different patients and think about potential future therapies. So these phase three trials can be carried out, need to be carried out in many centers using large numbers of patients. Um, and it's also the sort of thing that needs to be carried out in Europe and also in America due to regulation differences, right? So legal differences. Um, unfortunately, do not always allow us to combine things from everywhere around the world. So this, if you look now what was happening back in five years ago, 2010, from what I showed here, the first things were antioxidants, iron chelators. So these are the ones that did progress furthest. And as you can see, I'm sure all of you will have heard of idebenone um, and may even have been taking idebenone, which went through all the way to this large phase three clinical trial. And other antioxidant compounds also went through, and the iron chelator, deferoprone, was taken through to phase two, three studies. Um, and other, this is Chantix, which did not um, proceed beyond phase two. 
because um, some of these clinical trials do show potential adverse effects. So in this particular case for Chantix, um, some of the participants in the clinical study actually um, got worsened attacks, yeah? So that study was stopped. Further studies have not progressed because they did not see this essential statistically significant difference in the measure which may have been um, an ataxia rating scale, for example, or some other defined clinical measure. So, unfortunately, some of these have now stopped and didn't progress because of uh, the inefficacy, right? So, how have we then progressed over the last five years, which is what I'm now going to concentrate on? Here is the latest update from the FARA pipeline. And um, so the stages on the left are the same, essentially. They've added an extra sort of a regulatory requirement, which is required before you can go through to the clinical trials. But the emphasis has now shifted, right? The iron collator approach has gone, essentially. That's no longer on the list. Lots of those early antioxidant approaches have gone. They have been replaced by newer antioxidant approaches, which is the first group on the left, which says decreased oxidative stress uh, or increased mitochondrial function. So people are looking at different drugs, and these, some of these, as we'll see in a minute, have advanced quite well through to clinical trials. The emphasis has actually shifted more towards that increasing frataxin therapy, right? That's essentially what um, these other three approaches are. Or also, we know a lot more about what having, uh, not having enough frataxin does to the cells in the body. We know a bit more about the interactions, the metabolic pathways. So that's where a lot of these approaches are now faced, uh, focused on is tackling the disturbances within the cell, the metabolic disturbances, which may also involve increasing frataxin at the same time. Right? So that's the second group, which is called modulation of frataxin-controlled metabolic pathways. The third group is um, a way that you can, you can try and keep the, the protein that the cell does make. If you remember from my first slide, there is normal frataxin made at low levels. So if you can just keep that in the cell performing its normal function, that may be very beneficial. And there are drug approaches that you can take to stabilize the frataxin. Uh, we, we, over in the conference yesterday, we heard a couple of very interesting talks, which I'll talk about later, tackling this approach. And these are also quite, some of these are also well advanced. Another major group is to just increase frataxin expression by giving some drug. Right, some small compound which can get into cells and will be able to increase frataxin expression, as it's called, raising the levels of frataxin. This, I'm sure you're aware, has caused a lot of interest over the last five years using things like HDAC inhibitors, which are ways that you can increase gene expression. So I'm going to concentrate on these four groups, the first four, and then, as I said, Dr. evans Galea is going to talk about the more... Um, um, recent gene and stem cell therapies. So let me just take you through these four groups in a bit more detail about what's been going on. So these are, each one represents one of those bars in the pipeline, just to take you through some detail. So there is an antioxidant, EPI743, made by this company Edison, um, who are, and this compound aims to improve the mitochondrial function by countering the oxidative stress. And this has ongoing phase two clinical trials. Another compound, which is a naturally occurring compound, which also tackles oxidative stress, SHP622, which used to have other names. You may have heard of OX1, for example. And the company is Shire. So this is in earlier phase one trials. Some of the research from people like uh, Dr. Gino Cortopassi in the UC Davis identified that NRF2 is a potential um, target for drug therapy in Friedreich ataxia. This has been taken up by this company, Reata, who um, 
have actually initiated a phase 2-3 trial just this year with this compound, which they call an antioxidant inflammatory modulator, or AIM compound. Um, and this seems to uh, activate this particular NRF2 protein, and this protein is itself an activator of other genes, including the frataxin gene or other antioxidant genes, right, in the body. There are proteins that are made within the body which naturally tackle these damaging free radicals that are constantly produced within the, the cells. So this is well advanced um, studies now. Much more in the initial stages are companies like Retrotope who are looking at a way of stabilizing the lipids to prevent them from being damaged in the mitochondrial membranes and the cell membranes. And they've developed these compounds called deuterized polyunsaturated fatty acids. I'm sure you've all heard of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So they just change the, the composition very slightly, which makes these compounds able to form normal lipids, but they're then resistant to the oxidative damage. So this is a very promising approach. And um, then, again, at more preliminary stages, in Arizona State University, a researcher called Albert Hecht is working on multifunctional radical quenchers, as they call them. Again, a way to target the mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's the first group, the decreasing oxidative stress. And then the second group are these metabolic pathways, compounds that can help the cells make them more healthy in general. So groups in Brussels have identified that um, these compounds called incretins, which are natural gut hormones, normally controlling blood sugar levels. So they've developed similar compounds called analogs, which um, are used to treat diabetes, and they have been shown to increase frataxin levels in the pancreas, obviously one of the main defective tissues in, in the body. So this is um, Massimo Pandolfo and colleagues in Brussels are now initiating a small pilot trial for these types of compounds. Um, Professor Rob Wilson at University of Pennsylvania is looking at ways of um, increasing another of these transcription factors, PGC1-alpha, which controls energy metabolism in general in the cell. So just to boost the energy within cells in general. And again, this is uh, um, early stages of development. Slightly more advanced, as, as we've seen already, these things called NRF2 activators. So um, Gino Cortapassi, University College Davis, um, and we also contributed using our mouse models to identify this particular compound, diclonin, and he's also looking at another compound called dimethylfumarate. There was a poster at the meeting here on this this week. These compounds, again, activate this NRF2, which can then increase frataxin expression um, and may also have additional benefits of increasing antioxidants. So this is um, something that Gina's already published as a small pilot study, which um, seem to have good effects in increasing frataxin by looking at buccal cells in the mouth. There are other metabolic approaches being carried out in the University of South Florida to look at um, acetyl L-carnitine, or ALCAR for short, which is naturally occurring compounds um, involved in fatty acid breakdown and glucose metabolism. So this is, again, at phase two level. So efficacy studies are started. And then um, Martin Delaticchi and colleagues at the Murdoch Research Institute studied a compound called resveratrol. So this is a great compound because you get it from red grapes, right? So that, that was a very attractive starting point for looking at this compound. And it was shown to increase frataxin expression and possibly improve mitochondrial function as well. So I'm sure you're aware Martin did uh, carry out phase two studies, which did report improvement in some of the neurological rating scales and speech measures um, in high doses. But some of the studies um, 
will now need to be done, including having placebo groups. And Martin, I spoke to him a couple of days ago, is now actively trying to, to progress this to the next stage of clinical trial. But it is an expensive business that needs a lot of funding and a lot of um, patients. So the next group are these um, drugs that appear to somehow stabilize the frataxin protein in cells, right? keeping them there to be able to perform their normal function more. Even though there's lower levels, at least it'll be around for longer. So the cells will continue to make frataxin, and it will stay functional for longer because proteins are naturally degraded in cells. They don't last forever once they're made. Right? There is a turnover. So there are a number of compounds. Um, this one, erythropoietin, again, is a natural hormone, which has been studied for a number of years now, initially by groups in Vienna who identified this, but has been looked at by many groups. Uh, and they showed that it increases for taxin, but they didn't, didn't know how the levels of frataxin are increased. And I don't think we still fully understand uh, how it's increased, which is the case with a lot of these drugs, right? But we, we do see frataxin stabilizing or frataxin increasing effects, which is what we want. So EPO has undergone and completed phase two studies. It's shown to be well tolerated. It does produce sustained increases in frataxin. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have any, as I said, statistically significant effects on improving the essential clinical um, neurological and cardiac functions. Other um, companies, <coughs> excuse me, too much singing last night, I told you. I knew it would go eventually. The company here, Statigics, is now um, progressing by looking for other similar compounds which will do the same thing. We've just been joined by Roberto Testi, if my eyes are right, who's been doing a lot of good work, him and his group at the University of Rome, uh, Torvagata, who have um, yesterday had a couple of excellent talks identifying new compounds that can prevent uh, or at least reduce the amount of degradation of frataxin protein. And there are at least three different approaches that are being considered. So early stages yet. Um, back to the, the first obvious question. Let's just stick for taxing back into cells if that's the problem. And this is being considered for a number of years now. Mark Payne at Indiana um, University has been studying this. And he's started a spin-out company, Chondrial Therapeutics. Um, to look at ways of tackling this difficulty of getting a protein into cells. You can do it by sticking some other little tag uh, amino acids on, which will help it get through the cell membrane and ultimately into mitochondria as well. So I spoke to him yesterday, and he said things are rapidly advancing. He is very positive about this approach, and he told me to tell everyone to look out for things in about a year's time next summer. Right. And then this, we had a talk also from the company Bioblast, who are taking this on to further enhance the ability to target for taxin into uh, mitochondria. And this is now progressing, as we heard in the talk, to phase one trials as well. So this is all very promising research. The final group is actually one that I've been more actively involved in myself, um, ways to increase for taxin gene expression, right? I've showed that, I mentioned that if you have an open chromatin, you get more expression. When it's all closed down, you get decreased expression. So how can we intervene in this process, reverse this process to make open chromatin again? So there are a number of companies that have been doing this. Um, Replogen took forward HDAC inhibitors extensively through phase one trial. They showed it was well tolerated, it uh, did increase for taxin. Um, however, there were some issues such as uh, availability to get to the blood brain barrier into the brain, potential degradation of the compound into toxic compounds, which we don't want. So, this has now been uh, taken forward by Joel Gottesfeld and colleagues um, and the company Biomarin, who are now developing novel HDAC inhibitors to take forward through the uh, phase one, two, three pipelines. 
Richard Festenstein, Paolo Giunti and colleagues uh, studied in nicotinamide, which is also an HDAC inhibitor, uh, but it's also vitamin B3. And this, as they have published, has gone through a phase two sh trial, which showed increased for taxin, but the numbers were quite low, so this now needs to be taken forward into a larger clinical study, which Richard is actively uh, looking to promote. Roberto Testi and myself, he, he asked me to help him uh, look at why interferon gamma increased for taxin, right? So again, some of these serendipitous findings of increased for taxin occur. So a company, Horizon, is now taking forward interferon gamma, and they have already completed phase two, three studies. Um, they didn't see significant increase in for taxin, but there were indications of improved neurological function. So this is now um, progressing again into placebo-controlled phase three studies. There are lots of new companies getting involved in free drugs, which is great. One that I had the um, fortune to go and talk with a couple of years ago is based in Boston called Rana Therapeutics. They're looking at an, a small nucleotide-based therapy to, again, stabilize, in this case, the RNA, messenger RNA of frataxin. But the ultimate aim is, again, to increase frataxin. So these are early stages of development. And there may be many, and we are identifying many different compounds that can increase frataxin serendipitously, you know, it just means by chance, but let's, let's look at them, and then we'll find out how they do it later, right? They increase frataxin, so let's study them. Uh, and epigenetic approaches is what I'm looking at up here on the right. How do we reverse this process? That's what I mean by epigenetic approaches. So I and my colleagues at Brunel University London are looking at things called HMTAs inhibitors, which are kind of similar to the HDAC inhibitors in reversing this process. Again, early stages using some of the compounds in cells and hopefully in mice as well. And we looked at another compound called diazoxide in collaboration with uh, Dr. Carlo Morobio in Bari in Italy, who approached me to look at this. And we presented posters on both of these at the Itaxia meeting earlier this year. So I was going to go on, but I think I'd probably better stop there because I think my time is up. Uh, yes, right? Uh, I've kind of some. Uh, sorry? No, no, you wanted to talk about uh, another way of research? No, I'm just going to. I was just going to summarize the fact that we are obviously continually looking for additional new compounds using all of the available resources, patient cells that we grow in culture, um, neurons that we can get from skin cells from patients that we make into stem cells and then uh, differentiate into neurons or heart, which are obviously the most significant cells for the disease in uh, Friedreich ataxia. Me, uh, my group, and many others are now developing models. We have many different mouse models for Friedreich ataxia now which are enabling us to look at different compounds that dissect different parts of this therapeutic pipeline. We do still have some real basic questions that may give future drug targets, such as the, there is a fact that this GA repeat gets worse throughout life in cells. It gets larger, which should mean there's less frataxin, which might mean it may be involved in the disease progression. So we need to develop novel targets. There are many researchers around the world now looking at things like this, definitely looking at how does the GA repeat cause decreased levels of frataxin. Right? Lots of epigenetic approaches are now being considered by lots of basic research groups around the world. Again, targeting ways to increase frataxin by looking at how this gene is expressed. You can see it's a very complicated process. All these different colored things are different proteins that are all needed to make frataxin from the DNA, which is the double strand here. So there are lots of potential targets that we can now look at. High throughput screening is a, a way that we are identifying some of these novel approaches, such as the um, ways to uh, maintain frataxin within the cells by preventing its degradation. And then I will just finish again by saying this is the pipeline as we have it now. A lot of these compounds are now going into the ones that will ultimately tell us whether they 
can be then considered as a potential therapy for free ataxia.